Welcome everyone to our BJJ podcast for the month of August. I'm Andrew Duckworth and a warm welcome from your team here at the Bone and Joint Journal. As always, we'd like to thank our readers and listeners for the comments and support we continue to receive, as well as to our many authors and guest interviewers who have taken part so far. Over this year, we continue to build on the range of topics we have covered through our series so far, with a continuing aim to improve the accessibility and visibility of the studies we publish, for both you as our readers and listeners, as well as for our many authors. For this month's study, as you know, the next 20 minutes or so will cover a range of aspects for the chosen paper, emphasizing the important points of how the study has been put together, as well as the key findings from the paper and how these potentially fit into each of our day-to-day -day clinical practices. We also hope to give you a behind the scenes insight into how the authors have developed the study and give them an opportunity to put forward the key findings of the work. So today I have the pleasure of being joined by my editorial board colleague here at the journal, Professor Adam Watts from the Wrightington Upper Limb Unit to discuss their study entitled, Reliability and Validity of the Writing Classification of Elbow Fracture Desiccations, which has been published in the August edition of the BJJ. Welcome, Adam, and a big thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thanks very much, Andy, and uh, many thanks to the uh, BJJ for this opportunity. Absolute pleasure. No, it's, it's great to have you here, Adam. So if we go straight on to the paper, obviously the aim of the study was to assess the reliability, the reproducibility and the validity of the classification system that you've developed at Wrightington. So if you can give us a brief introduction to the paper and some background to these injuries and how they've traditionally been classified. Thanks, Andy. So uh, first of all, if I can uh, acknowledge my co-authors, Jag Singh, Mike Elvey, and uh, particularly Zaid Hamoudi, who put a huge amount of work uh, into bringing this study together. When we treat uh, elbow fracture dislocations, it can get quite confusing with uh, lots of different types of injury, terrible triads, Montegia, Montegia variants, and post-remedial uh, fracture dislocations. And each of these have their own uh, classification system. And understandably, for, for the occasional uh, elbow surgeon, this can lead to, uh, to a lot of confusion. This study was uh, designed to assess a new classification tool that was designed to identify patterns of elbow fracture dislocation, which is based on the important stabilizing structures of the elbow. All too often, we uh, assess the radiographs of the elbow fracture dislocations. Our eye is drawn to the radial head fracture the most obvious injury that we see, or the injury to the electron or ulna shaft. And we tend to ignore the most important element, which is the coronoid process, often hiding in the shadows behind the radial head uh, on the lateral projection. But actually the coronoid is the key to understanding these injuries. Historically, uh, we've used the Regan Amori classification, which assesses the coronoid injury based on the loss of height on the lateral projection. The problem is that uh, it doesn't discriminate between those injuries where the coronoid fracture leads to instability and it doesn't differentiate between medial and lateral coronoid injuries. O'Driscoll introduced a really important uh, classification which was a, a good advance in describing the coronoid as a three-dimensional structure, a fan-shaped structure, with different elements of this bony structure that can be injured. It has many strengths, but people do struggle to remember the components of the system, and that can lead to challenges with reliability. And it also doesn't consider what's happened to the radial head or to the important stabilizing ligaments. Uh, and that's why we felt there was room for a, a, a more universal classification system to guide management. That's a great overview, Adam. I think, like you say, I think the, the key I found with the system and after reading the paper, and as you know, I've, I've, I've heard talk about it before, is that idea of the coroid being the key, you know, that that's what we need to build everything around. And also with that appreciation of the soft tissue component, which is often with all these injuries, what we're really chasing is stability to the elbow, isn't it? So that we can initiate early range of motion and prevent stiffness in the elbow, which is what we're always really fighting. Would you agree with that? I think that's absolutely right. I think that you should view the, the bony injury as the tell. It, it indicates the likely soft tissue injury. So if you can understand the patterns of injury, you can infer from that the likely soft tissue injury that also needs to be addressed because we can't restore stability just by addressing the bony elements, right. we also have to restore integrity of the soft tissues. Absolutely. So if we, so we move on to the, the classification system, I know it's often diff, difficult on a podcast, but can you describe how that was sort of developed and what it sort of entails and how it potentially can guide treatment as well? 
Yeah, so it is hard uh, to describe without uh, illustrations. And so I'd encourage people to, to read the paper where the illustrations will make a lot of this clearer. But essentially, the right into classification is based on a three column concept of elbow stability. Uh, and in brief, this considers the stability to come from the anteromedial facet of the coronoid, which is the medial column, the anterolateral facet of the coronoid, which is the middle column, and then the radial head, which is the lateral column. The fulcrum for varus and valgus sits between the anteromedial and the anterolateral facets of the coronoid process. As we've already uh, talked about, Andy, the stability also comes from the ligaments and the muscles, the neuromuscular elements around the elbow. Uh, and these are particularly important on the lateral side of the elbow around the radial head, where we've got relatively little uh, bony congruity, uh, and therefore the soft tissue elements become uh, much more important compared to the medial side, where the distal humerus is covered uh, through an arc of almost 180 degrees. And so the osseous elements on the medial side are much more important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the elbow collapses into varus around that fulcrum uh, between the anteromedial and anterolateral facet, the medial column is what becomes broken. So that's the anteromedial facet. The middle and lateral column remain intact because the humerus moves away from those structures. But the lateral ligament gets pulled off as a sleeve from the humerus. So this is a type A, an anteromedial, from the right hand classification, an anteromedial facet fracture, uh, or what's also known as a postromedial fracture dislocation. Driscoll described this as postromedial rotatory instability. So you can see how the nomenclature becomes quite confusing for people, but essentially this is a, an injury where you've got an isolated coronoid fracture. Mm -hmm. It'll often look like a Regan and Mori type 1 injury, so what people often refer to as a tip of coronoid fracture, but actually it's a really important uh, injury because instability will often follow from, from this injury pattern because of the associated soft tissue injury. The posterior band of the, of the medial ligament may be torn too. And the treatment for these injuries is to fix the important lateral soft tissue stabilizers and to restore the medial column in whatever way. And, and there, are, you know, there are various ways to address that, which is probably beyond the scope of this uh, discussion. Sure. If you apply, um, sort of moving on to the type B pattern, so if you apply a direct axial force, you'll break both the anteromedial and the anterolateral facet uh, of the coronoid. So that's a bifacet or basal fracture, which is a type B in the right into classification. The radial head may be fractured or it may escape. So in an apex anterior Monteggia or Monteggia-like lesion, the radial head moves anteriorly away from the humerus and will remain intact. Uh, and you can just have the bifacet coronoid element. And in this situation, because both facets of the coronoid are, are injured, particularly the involvement of the anteromedial facet, it's really important to fix the coronoid and all of our treatments should be aimed at restoring the integrity of the coronoid. The radial head needs to be addressed as well, either with, if it is fractured, either with plating or with headless screws or with replacement. Uh, and any uh, lateral ligament injury needs to be addressed if it is torn. But in some of the B plus type of injuries, your ligaments will be intact because the whole forearm has actually moved closer to the humerus mm -hmm. and so the working length of the ligaments is actually shortened if you like and so those ligaments can be intact the posterior elements of the of the ligamentous comp complexes may be torn but the anterior bands uh, will be intact and so if you restore the bony anatomy then actually stability can be restored in those situations mm -hmm. Moving on to the type C, uh, so th this is where the elbow collapses into valgus. It's often a valgus external rotation injury. The anteromedial facet uh, or medial column escapes injury in this situation, and you get an injury to the anterolateral facet and radial head. So this is a combined anterolateral facet and radial head fracture, Wrightington C, which is also what we would consider to be a terrible triad injury. The lateral ligament, we can infer, will be torn in these injuries and will need to be addressed. And so this injury is treated by restoring the radial head, the lateral ligament, 
but the coronoid, because it's just an anterolateral facet, a middle column injury, doesn't need to be addressed uh, as long as we've restored the lateral column. Uh, and that's sometimes difficult for people to understand. And I know that a lot of people do try and put sutures around these anterolateral facet uh, fractures. But as long as you have, uh, are sure that it doesn't extend to involve the anteromedial facet, and as long as you've done a good job in fixing the lateral ligament complex and addressing the radial head, then actually that anterolateral facet fracture of the coronoid doesn't need to, to, to be individually fixed. Uh, and the comminuted radial head with an intact coronoid also fits into this type C because the treatment is the same. So it's a, a matter of addressing the radial head and addressing the lateral ligament complex. And then the last group of injuries are those which are distal to the coronoid process. So that's a, a diaphyseal or distal injury, a type D uh, in the right hand classification, where the contribution of the coronoid to stability is essentially not affected. Uh, but the ulna uh, is fractured and the radial head will be either fractured or dislocated. And so the ulna needs to be addressed to bring the radius back into alignment and then the radial lateral column needs to be uh, addressed and the lateral ligament may need to be fixed in those to again to restore stability. So we end up with a, a classification system with type A which is an anteromedial facet fracture, type B a bifacet fracture with or without a radial head fracture, type C comminuted radial head or combined radial head and then anterolateral facet fracture and type D, which is a diaphyseal fracture, which is distal to the coronoid with a, uh, or without a radial head fracture. So I hope that I haven't confused things too much for people with that. But uh, as I say, I think the illustrations in the manuscript probably make things a lot clearer. But that's an overview of what we've described. No, I think that's brilliant, Adam. And I think, like I say, it's difficult without the diagram, which is obviously figure two in the paper when it comes out. But I think that was a really great description. As you know, I'm also a big believer in, in what you've described, and particularly those the terrible tire, the type C. Uh, and I think certainly there has been a vogue of moving away if they're a true terrible tire, and it's just that anterolateral facet of just fixing the, or replacing the radial head and repairing the lateral ligament. And they're probably one of the most common types, as we'll see coming on. But that's a really good overview and I think the great great thing about it as well is it's not just a classification system that describes the injury pattern it help, also helps guide treatment which I think is the limitation of a lot of our classification systems that are out there not just in the elbow but throughout orthopedics so if we then move on to the study it was obviously a retrospective review of your prospective trauma database you have there uh, for your elbows all patients were over 16 years of age and they had a fracture dislocation of the elbow between 2010 to 2018 so just for the listeners, could you give a brief overview of the database that was used, uh, the sort of inclusion and exclusion criteria to be included in this study? Yeah, so we included all elbow fracture dislocations that were treated surgically in the uh, database. So there are injuries where the patients may not have proceeded to, to surgical uh, intervention for various reasons. So these are only the surgically uh, managed patients over the age of 16 years. For inclusion in this study, the patients had to have a complete set of preoperative radiographs and CT scans from which we could construct 3D reconstructions and a full operative record detailing the pathoanatomy of the injury for reasons that we'll come on to, to talk about probably later on. Yeah. Um, one of the issues that we had uh, in the study, because we had a total of, uh, of 60 fracture dislocations identified within the database, but many of the patients were referred from external centres. Uh, and with the PAC system, when CT scans are transferred, they're not always uh, transferred in a format that enables 3D reconstruction. Uh, and so they had to be excluded from the study. Yeah. And how many was that, Adam? It was a relatively small number, wasn't it, I believe, in the end? That were excluded. From the total number, I think it was. But there was no particular difference between the characteristics from those included and excluded, I believe. Is that right? There were no differences in the characteristics of the two. So we looked at age, gender. Uh, we looked at uh, fracture patterns between those that were included and excluded, and we found no statistical differences between the two. Yeah. We included 49 patients out of 60 uh, yeah. within the database yeah. in the study. Yeah. Uh, just 11 were excluded. Excellent, excellent. So, Adam, if we move on to the observers, obviously uh, there were seven observers uh, in the study that looked at the various imaging modalities. So why were they chosen and what sort of information were they provided with? 
So Andy, uh, we wanted to ensure that the classification could be used by all those who treat elbow fracture dislocations, not just those with a specialist interest in the elbow. Mm. And therefore, we approached trainees, we approached fellows in upper limb surgery, and we approached surgeons from district general hospitals with a general practice and specialist trauma surgeons. So that we tried to get a breadth of experience across the surgical field. Mm -hmm. the type of uh, people who may be uh, addressing these uh, types of injuries. Sure. We gave the surgeons uh, a description of the classification and an illustrative guide, and they were provided with anonymized CDs containing the images of the patients uh, uh, for the elbows that were included in the study. And they were then asked to classify the injury, and initially from the x-rays alone, and then we asked them to classify based on the 2D CT scan and finally uh, with the 3D reconstructions. And they were asked to do this at two separate time intervals, uh, at least a month apart. Okay, great. That's a yeah, really good description, obviously, the various imaging modalities used. And what was your sort of gold standard for confirming the diagnosis in those 48 patients included? So this is where the operative record came into, into importance. So the, the operative record of the pathoanatomy was taken as the gold standard. So that was the record of the injury to the radial head, the coronoid process, but also the important soft tissue injury as well, and the yeah. description of that from the operation note. Yeah, so it's a very robust sort of gold standard to make sure that the classification was right. And before we move on to the results, can you just give a brief overview of the analysis that you performed and remind me more probably than our listeners, the difference between the reliability, reproducibility and validity when assessing these things, as well as the Landis and Koch criteria, which you used in the study. Yeah, so, so as I've said, we, we had seven surgeons who assessed the imaging on two separate occasions uh, and at least a month apart. Um, and we assessed the inter-observer reliability. That's how consistent an assessment tool is at measuring uh, what it is meant to measure. Hmm. And uh, this was measured using the multi-observer Fleiss Kappa statistic. The intra-observer reproducibility, which is a measure of uh, whether you'll get the same answer if you repeat the assessment, uh, was assessed using the Cohen Kappa statistic. Uh, and then the validity of the classification, which is essentially the accuracy of uh, that, that measurement, whether the uh, measurement tool is measuring what it's supposed to measure, which in this instance uh, is the agreement between the classification and the operative findings, was assessed using percentage of that agreement between the x-rays and the and CT scans and the operative uh, record. Mm -hmm. In order to maintain consistency in nomenclature when describing uh, relative strength and agreement between the Kappa statistics, uh, Landis and Koch in 1977, fairly arbitrarily, but in a way that has been widely adopted, assigned parameters to the, K, the Kappa value. So if the Kappa is less than zero, it's poor, zero to 0 0.2, there's slight agreement, 0.21 to 0.4, there's fair agreement. 0.41 to 0.6 moderate, 0.61 to 0.8 substantial, and uh, 0.81 to 1 almost perfect agreement. And that really has been widely adopted uh, amongst the, uh, the orthopedic community. Perfect, great. And so if we move on to the results, 48 patients had a mean age of 49 years, three had a type A, the right in the classification injury, 11 a type B, 16 a type B plus, 16 a type C, which is, like you say, like the terrible triad, and then type two type D pluses, but none had a, a type D injury. Uh, and there were no significant differences in the demographics of fracture classes between those patients, including and excluded, as we've already said. Just before we move on to the key findings, Adam, no type D injuries. Was there a reason for that in particular that you can think of? Is it just one of those things or...? So we did have type D injuries in the series, but unfortunately the cases were from external tertiary referrals essentially. And so we weren't able to do 3D reconstructions of those injuries. Yeah. It's just a less common injury, hence the low numbers. I think it's unfortunate and it, it is a, a weakness of the study that we weren't able to include those, but uh, unfortunately that was the material that we had to work with. Absolutely, like you say, they're, they're relatively rare injuries, aren't they? If you could then just move on to the, those key findings in relation to the performance of the, of the classification, what do you feel the key findings of the study in relation to particularly the inter and intra-observable reliability? 
Well, the, the main observation uh, was that the writing classification is reliable, it's reproducible, uh, and it's valid across the seven observers. The spread of observations was very narrow, and therefore, given the numbers of observers that we had, we weren't able to determine whether there was an effect of uh, surgeon grade on accuracy mm. or of surgeon specialty on accuracy. But, but what we found was actually that it was pretty consistent across the observers that everybody was able to achieve a very a, a, a pretty consistent uh, outcome using this classification, which was reassuring, I suppose. Yeah. Absolutely, no, and like I say, it means it's more generalizable for a variety of surgeons of various experience and, uh, with these type of injuries. And how did the various imaging modalities compare in terms of, you know, you had x-rays, the 2D CTs and the 3D CT reconstructions? Well, the main observation was that the, the use of CT improved the accuracy of the classification. Yeah. We only had moderate reliability based on plain radiographs, but when we include CT scans in the assessment of the injury, uh, then the inter-observer reliability increased to, to substantial. Yeah. Uh, so really a, a strong uh, uh, argument for the use of CT scans. Mm -hmm. The intra-observer reproducibility was substantial based on plain radiographs and on CT scans. Mm -hmm. The inclusion of a 3D reconstruction improved that uh, even further to almost perfect with a significant difference uh, based on the assessment on the x-rays alone. Mm. So it looks like the use of, uh, of CT scans is valuable in, in assessing these uh, injuries, certainly for this classification. Absolutely, sure, mm. absolutely. And then the, uh, lastly, uh, just the validity of the classification, which was confirmed with over 70% agreement um, with the surgical findings uh, based on plain x-rays. Uh, and again, that increased further when we based our assessment on the CT scan. So uh, an, an over 85% agreement. I say we, I should emphasize that I was not involved in, uh, as the developer of the classification, I was not involved in assessing uh, any of these uh, radiographs within this study. This was all done by... Independent people. Members. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and just finally, before we move on to... The implications of the study, what did you find regards the sensitivity testing that you used to examine the ability of the observers to identify each sort of subtype of the classification? Yeah, so again, our, our observations here were slightly limited with the low numbers for some types of injury. And I think it would be an interesting to, thing to look at in a larger cohort of, uh, of patients. But we found that the observers could quite accurately identify a type C injury. So that's a terrible triad injury mm. or, or a comminuted uh, radial head fracture, even from plain radiographs. So mm. they had about 88% agreement. Yeah. The use of CT uh, with 3D reconstruction improved their accuracy to 100%. Yeah. So again, really strengthening the case for, for the use of CT. On the other hand, there was only 69% agreement between the operative findings and plain x-rays for a B-plus type uh, injury. But this rose to 94% when uh, a CT scan uh, was used. So I think the important take-home message from that is that the assessment of coronoid fracture configuration is difficult for most observers from plain x-rays. Yeah, uh, and that the CT scan can substantially improve our assessment of that. And, and for, for that reason, I would strongly encourage the, the, the routine use of CT for these injuries. Absolutely, sure. And just before we move on, I'm just looking at, you know, table six there. I know there's only a three type A injuries, but even with the, the, the 2D and 3D CT, it's, it's still nowhere near comparative, is it, in terms of, you know, these are difficult, these PMRI or whatever type injuries you want to describe them as, they're rare but difficult to identify, but very important we do so. It's, it's a difficult problem, that almost, isn't it? <laughs> It is. It, I think that, that it's about education, it's about recognition. So very often these type A uh, injuries, injuries to the anteromedial facet uh, of the coronoid process, will be dismissed as simple dislocations of the elbow with a flake avulsion mm -hmm. of the coronoid process. And we really need to get the message out there very clearly that this is not a simple dislocation. This is a, an elbow fracture dislocation with an important injury to an important bony stabilizer of the elbow, the anteromedial facet. 
And once you start to, to recognize that and change the thought process, then it'll prompt you to get the CT scan and to better understand what's going on. So if you see a, what may be considered to be a tip of coronoid fracture in isolation, then this is a type A anteromedial facet fracture until proven otherwise. And definitely I would get a CT scan or an MRI scan uh, in that situation. You know, I couldn't agree with that more. And I have to say, you know, from discussion with you, I think it's something like you say, I think it's often dismissed as an elbow dislocation with a simple tip fracture and, and carry on. But actually, we, we need to look into those more in more detail and not to be missed because they are relatively rare as well. So if we move on to the key findings of the work, what do you feel that they are, Adam, in terms of you know, its position in the literature and it, obviously considering any potential limitations, but uh, what, what it really adds? Uh, well, I think the writing to classification gives us a valid, reliable and reproducible classification system that encompasses all elbow fractures dislocations that we're uh, faced with. And importantly for a classification, this also gives us a guide as to how to manage the injuries. So we have algorithms uh, assigned to each category that can give people a, a route map uh, to, to managing these things. Uh, and the routine use of CT scan can clearly strengthen the accuracy of our assessment of the injuries and will hopefully prevent missteps in their management and the, the later dislocations that can uh, present after management of these injuries that can be difficult to salvage. Yeah, no, absolutely. What's your interpretation of how it, it compares and fits in with the other historical classification systems that we discussed at the beginning? Well, this is the first uh, system that is a universal classification system. It's the first one that really includes all of the injury um, patterns uh, of fracture dislocation around the elbow. Uh, and it helps us hopefully to understand or to organize our thoughts and to guide our treatment. Uh, but, but I suppose most importantly, it's the first classification uh, that's, uh, that's actually been validated yeah. with injuries. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And in terms of, you know, moving forward, what would you feel the next steps are? I mean, obviously, this is one of the, the major first papers that's come out related to the classification system. You've know, talked about it a lot before, but what would you feel the next steps are for it? Well, I think that, you know, we've looked within our own practice at, at how this can be applied to the management of these injuries. Uh, and we've shown that in, in our hands, following these algorithms, which are not my algorithms, these are algorithms taken from the literature for managing these injury, injury patterns. So it's based on many expert uh, surgeons experience of these injuries. But by following this uh, classification, by following these algorithms, we've been able to demonstrate reliable and consistent outcomes for these injuries. But we don't know if that's going to be reproducible and generalizable, and that needs to be demonstrated for others. That, that is, we can either establish a, a multi-center study to assess that, uh, but certainly other centers need to explore whether these uh, pathways work in their hands. No, I totally agree, Adam. Absolutely. Well, I think that's actually all we have time for today, Adam, but thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I really enjoyed that and congratulations on a really excellent study, which uh, that is without doubt an invaluable addition to the literature and certainly has been a big influence on, on my practice. But thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. And uh, I'd also just like to take the opportunity to thank all of the uh, surgeons and trainees who uh, contributed uh, to completing this study. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Adam. And to our listeners, we do hope you've enjoyed joining us and we encourage you to share your thoughts and comments through Twitter, Facebook and the like. Feel free to post or tweet about anything we've discussed here today and thanks again for joining us.